100 years ago, your only source of helium was in fact a particular sand called monazite sand, which was uh, not known very much about in the world. And there were only two sources in the world at that time. One was in Bath, and the other was in North Carolina, America. Um, the idea of getting helium in, from natural gas had not been developed because it hadn't been discovered. And the first production of helium from natural gas didn't take place until about 1919, after World War I. Um, so helium, really, it was hard work if you were going to uh, venture down into the into liquid helium that day. You had to buy vast quantities of sand, monazite sand, and ship it across. This is what the Camelingonis did. Uh, he shipped, shipped his sand over from, from North Carolina and he found that he was able to get about one liter of gas. Pretty mucky stuff. It had some helium in it, but it had hydrogen and, and oxygen, goodness knows what else as well. Uh, one liter of gas for each kilogram of sand that he burned. He had to burn it in order to get the helium out. And he needed something like 500 liters of gas. That's about half a liter of liquid uh, in order to do his, 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 his early liquefaction runs. In other words, he needed about half a ton of sand to process in order to get the helium in order to be able to do his liquefaction. Life was tough. And if you compare your lot today with what Coro Camelionis had to put up with that, then uh, count your blessings, that's all I got. Whether you've got short, whether you're short of helium or not. Life is a lot easier than it was then. I'll stop there. <laughs> had succeeded to liquefy helium and he had reached the limit of several Kelvin. Uh, he had in his hands a new tool to study uh, the electrical resistance and uh, he participated in uh, the theoretical controversy discussion about the behavior of clean metal resistance at low temperatures. Electron was discovered uh, by J.J. Thompson in 1897, uh, it became clear uh, that the electron was the important thing in conducting electricity in metals. On the other hand, the classical theory of physics, of m mechanics, of, of particles, uh, was totally inadequate to describe how uh, electrons could move in metal. It, until the wave theory of electrons came along, nobody could understand how an electron could move through the lattice of ions in a metal without colliding. Uh, it was Bloch in 1927 who produced a theory which made clear how that could happen. So before that, when Camling Honest was working, uh, people believed that electrons could conduct electricity. They hadn't the beginning of a clue of how it happened. And some people believed that as you cooled a metal, the electrons would eventually freeze out and you get a resist resistance rising to infinity. Honest and others believed that for some reason unknown, the electrons would be able to move more easily at low temperatures and so the resistance would drop to zero. And others thought one thing or another, you know, nobody knows. It was, it was a total mystery. Uh, and these just ha these hazardous theories were put forward. Well, when when Onnes and Holst did their experiment on mercury, and they found the resistance dropped to zero, Camling Onnes thought, right, I'm right after all, the resistance does fall to zero. But they did another experiment and found to their great surprise it fell precipitously, didn't go steadily to zero, but went with a bang. And that was what totally, absolutely beyond anybody's understanding, and it remained so until uh, 46 years later. Uh, the first theory of Bardeen Cooper and Schrieffer explained how that could happen. 28th of April of 1911, he delivered his famous talk to the Dutch Royal Physical Society, and he told, I'm right the resistance of clean metal turns zero at low temperatures. This is written in 
many handbooks. But it is not written that actually there were two uh, talks. First, that resistance turns zero and it is pro-theory of Cameron Owens. The second, that it turns zero not in the same way as it had to be in accordance with his theory. He discovered that resistance initially drops continuously as the temperature decreases. When the so-called transition temperature is reached though, mercury behaves entirely differently to the metals previously studied. At this temperature, its electric resistance changes abruptly to zero, and the current is transported without losses. This effect was given the name of superconductivity. Scientific society recognized the importance of this discovery very soon. Since this discovery, numerous superconducting materials have been identified. The phenomenon of superconductivity, which will suddenly appear in materials at a certain temperature, is better understood today. The peculiar nature of superconductivity is the absence of dissipation, is that if you put energy into the electric current, it stays there. Normally, if you put energy into the electric current, the electric current slows down and the body warms up, which we understand to mean that the energy diffused into all the other degrees of freedom. The first phenomenological theory, uh, classical theory, which tried to collect the um, available experimental fact, facts and explain in some way was the theory of Brothers uh, Lang. They have succeeded to, not to explain, but to arrange in some way the no fact of the zero resistance and expulsion of magnetic field. A state which is called a superconducting state, where there is no electrical resistance whatsoever. This conventional picture, this conventional way of seeing how current flows breaks down. Because there is no way by which you can understand in terms of classical physics that there can be a state where there is no electrical resistance at all. It's important not to try to hang on to the simple views of the electrons. If you stick to it, you never understand superconductivity. And it's not intuitive, it is counterintuitive in a sense to try to think in these terms. But you must do it. If you don't do it, you are stuck and you will never understand superconductivity. Second great discovery of 1950. It was the discovery of isotopic effect. The critical temperature for different isotopes of metals. So the mass of nuclear was different. The formula was that Tc was proportional 1 over square root of the mass of nucleus. This discovery demonstrated to us that electronic properties, superconductivity, cannot be treated without their connection with the lattice of superconductor. 